Uh, hello and welcome to the closing session of the 20th annual Northwest Interlibrary Loan and Resource Sharing Conference. Today is September 3rd, 2021, and I am Mary Monick, the conference chairperson. This session is being recorded with permission from the presenters, uh, myself and our special guests. The, we retain the copyright to any information we are presenting and may request its removal from the public viewing in the future by written requests of the annual chair person, whomever that may be. However, at this time, it is planned that recordings will be available once captions have been added. Attendees will be notified when recordings are available. To turn live captioning on, click the CC link at the bottom of the screen and select show subtitle. If you have a question during the session, please use the Q&A function in Zoom. The final door prize code will be review, revealed at the end of my closing remarks. I would also like to take a moment and acknowledge the effects of Hurricane Ida on several of our attendees. Um, and will hopes that you are all safe and that your family, friends, animals, and books have made it through this week with the support you need. Before I continue further, uh, Enwell wishes to acknowledge that the territory that called North America, now primarily occupied by descendants of European colonizers and other immigrants, is the rightful land of indigenous Native American and First Nations populations. We are all responsible for understanding the history of colonization and genocide of indigenous people and must commit to learning, building relationships, sharing stories, and taking action to support Indigenous sovereignty, priorities, and actions. We encourage you to learn about the Indigenous people to whom the land you occupy rightfully belongs. Please visit the documents section of the conference platform to learn more or the nwill.org website. On that note, um, I am going to turn our closing remarks over to our special to our special guest today, who should be able to interrupt my Absolutely. screen share. <laughs> Let me get this started here in case people know my voice. <laughs> um, there we go. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and uh, and uh, I, I get to appear as a special guest, which I think is the first time I've ever appeared at a conference as a special guest. So so thank you so much for inviting me. Um, obviously, someday we will get to all meet in person. That's what I'm hoping for. In the meanwhile, uh, my 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 invitation to closing remarks here today are, are focused on something that I, I by the list of 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 uh, different. Uh, proceedings you've already had and the lightning talks um, that may be near and dear to your heart. Um, copyright and access lessons for libraries that we've learned maybe during the pandemic um, and our, this COVID crisis. Uh, and we're going to touch on some of these topics here today. Um, and I invite you, of course, uh, uh, to you know, participate. Um, so I'm going to go through these topics in a very timely manner, meaning it's the end of the conference. I don't want to spend all time here, but know that I could talk about this for a long time with you. And, and, and I value conversations that we can have about this in the future, whether on the platform or together. But it's going to be a little rapid, but that's OK. I, I thought thematically we could visit some things. So without further ado, let's let's talk a little bit about some of the stuff that one of the things I want to kind of emphasize immediately um, is the Library and Archive COVID narrative that I started seeing playing out as much as 16 months ago. Uh, libraries were closed, they can't perform their normal functions. Um, suddenly, everything that we had acquired and may want to loan <laughs> to our, our, our colleagues, our friends, uh, our users, our patrons are trapped in libraries, you know, that idea of things being trapped. And there's estimates that there's about 650 million books were on shelves at that time period. No physical access, no interlibrary loan, no document delivery, no reserves, even so far as seeing statements about that you cannot read books aloud online that somehow had, had gone out. Um, we saw a lot of narratives about 
electronic access required permission or licensing only. There was no other way to get it. Uh, for a while, some vendors and publishers did make free versions available, but certainly that time is significantly over now. Um, and to me, it, it, it read that somehow print had no value suddenly because we couldn't get at it. Yet we spent millions in acquisitions, and, and I think this is fun, and let's just label this entire narrative as false. Right. This all of this is actually false. We, we have a lot more rights than we think we did. And, and I'd like to emphasize that narrative here. The other thing is the United States Copyright Office came out and they also commented on what was going on here. They said, yes, expanding licensing is key. Uh, some publishers and authors have allowed read along licenses. That's the first time I've really seen those before. 74% um, of public libraries are reporting more ebooks and streaming media. We'll talk about the implications of that in a moment. And then they had things like it's generally understood that many uses of copyrighted works by schools and universities must be licensed. Um, <laughs> and I was like, well, that's not generally understood. Um, and in fact, reading this, I. I, I, I label this entire narrative as also false. This is not actually uh, what was going on. There was there was plenty of stuff that happened without a license and without permission because that's what we're intended to do here. And, and this was thematically kind of uh, expressed, not necessarily by the library community themselves, um, but certainly by rights holders and organizations that were, I think, taking advantage of the fact that our libraries were closed and didn't foresee that Libraries can actually harness technology to do what we need to do when there's no physical access. And, and this is a part of a longer strain, and, and I always like to raise this, where rights holders and publishers have attempted to curtail the library mission. This is not a new moment, right? It was just a most recent moment where they were pressing licensing and pressing permission. Um, they have attempted to curtail interlibrary loan in the past photocopiers in libraries, uh, open access, uh, e-reserves, increasing access for the print disabled. There was a whole lawsuit about that and they argued that that should not exist. Text and data mining, most recently controlled digital lending. And what about the right to borrow and loan books? You, you may find that funny that, that certain rights holders and publishers have attempted to curtail the ability to write and borrow books, but even as far back as the 30s, they, they uh, hired a strategist to come up with a pejorative word for those that borrow books. And they said the wretch who raised hell with book sales and deprived authors of royalties, kind of forgetting that libraries, you know, pay for our books um, and don't deprive anyone of royalties, we purchase these. So they came up with all these names here, right? The, the borrow coal, the library side, the book looter, the, the book bum. I mean, these are incredible. Um, these are great names. So, you know, maybe I should have started off my, my <laughs> uh, talk with, you know, welcome book weevils and buccaneers, because uh, that's, that's what I could bitter myself as well. Um, I cut my teeth into library loan. That's where I started. Um, and, and certainly, I think all of us are, are proud book weevils or buccaneers. So thematically, you know, how can we you know, deal with these, these things? Well, a couple of ways. One, we can make decisions as a community to do a few things. We can reject the out of control licensing culture, which is being presented to us, right? That idea, you need a license to do anything, everything. And that's not true. Interlibrary loan, reserves, et cetera, are, are, you know, do not require licenses. We can reject these devaluations of the significant legal and economic values that we have in our library collections, right? This is, this is our stuff, so to speak. Um, we can reject excessively narrow fair use analysis. You know, I love to do that. And we can reject fear of technology, preventing legitimate legal uses that fit within our mission, right? We're not here to make profits, we're here to provide access. So if we're using technology to provide access, we're not stepping on anyone's tolls necessarily. We have a nonprofit educationally based mission. So let's spin this to the positive. We can brace fair use as flexibility as a right. We can promote open licensing culture. We don't need a license for everything. Some things we do, but not for everything. And we can encourage use of the library's superpowers. I focus on section 108, which is the engine of a lot of libraries work. And we can continue to support copyright's real public purpose, right? It was written in the constitution to promote the progress of, of science and the useful arts. And again, I just like to remind everyone here, historically, it's kind of a fun fact. In addition to the book weevil aspect, when it was written into the constitution, we didn't pass the law right away. We passed the first copyright act in 1790. And it wasn't an act for profits, an act for people to sell books. It was an act for the encouragement of learning. That was the first copyright act in this country. You know, the, the idea um, is, is, is that, uh, that, and so where do we talk about this? So, uh, you know, I, 
I talked previously with, with, with some of your sponsors. I talk a lot about this in my program that I have nationally called the Copyright First Responder. Some of you may be familiar with this. And if not, the CFRs are in 12 states now where we talk directly about how we can embrace fair use and reject license and culture and preserve the legal and economic value that we have um, in our particular um, uh, area. Um, and, and just real fast, um, this is an immersive learning copyright environment, which is a method I completely borrowed um, from other educational programs, right? You're immersed in the language of copyright law, right? Language programs do this, you know, French, German, Spanish, Japanese. So, and perhaps the most important hallmark of this learning CFR program that I run is that you build a shared understanding and also a trust which fosters willingness to raise questions about these topics, right? It was never more critical to have CFR groups than during these last 16 months where we could discuss potential solutions to copyright questions. It's not only the training, but the shared experience of creating a thoughtful network of engaged, empowered colleagues that care about these issues, um, that understand copyright, that continue to learn together. Um, and ultimately, we, we live in service of, well, at least better service to our communities, our collections, our institutions, and the scholarly enterprise. So let's let's continue on our way here. That's my little thing with, uh, about CFR. But one of the other library pandemic lessons is about this licensing. And my concern here is that if you read any of the licenses, I'm sure many of you had, you're like, can we loan this? What can we do with this? If you're getting an ebook or a database or a platform, licenses generally prevent what we do. Um, and we, we have to kind of shift shift out on there because it can prevent loans. It can prevent you from doing it to library loan or providing access, or it can restrict ownership. You don't own these, right? Or it can restrict preservation activities. Um, or additionally, it charges you more money, right? You're a library? Well, we're not going to sell to you at all. Or you're a library, or we're going to charge you between five times and 30 times the price that we charge a consumer. Or they're just not going to license to you at all. Right, we see this a lot with streaming media and certain ebooks. Um, you can't get a, 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 a you can't get a site license. You can't get a department license. You can't get a campus license. So how are you going to get these materials? So the, the the result is we don't have interlibrary loan under Section 08. We don't have document delivery. We don't have preservation. We don't have first sale rights for loaning. Uh, recently, I was thinking like, well, what does this turn us into? It turns us into Hulu or Netflix, right? We, with all these licenses, baby, make libraries and acquisitions and interlibrary loan departments and Dockdale, we're, we're just renters or we're leasing this material temporarily. We don't own them. We can't keep them. Um, and we can't do certain things with them. And, and Heather Joseph uh, a month ago or two months ago said something interesting on a talk we were on. She was like, you might as well just swap out the library card for a credit card because that's, that's what's happening here. So what if we want to make sure that our mission is not threatened by these particular things? Well, one solution would be pretty easy, right? Ask publishers and vendors to stop selling libraries materials with overly restrictive licenses. That would be simple enough, right? Sell them with full rights to us. So, you know, actually sell them to us so we can have what we need in order to accomplish our mission, right? Which is nonprofit preservation, education, research, and access. So we can continue to give <laughs> access to materials that we have purchased. Now, that's a big ask, right? They would have to change those licenses. But we're a narrow market. I think it's worth it. But Will rights holders ever change these restrictive and costly licensing terms on their own? Probably not. <laughs> um, you know, why not? You know, why, why have one site license when I can pay, when I can get you to give me 4,000 individual payments from personal use only licenses or something along those lines? So my other solution is version two, which I've been talking about. Use the same laws that have been weaponized against libraries. I've been talking about licensing, right? Contract and licensing law. Why, why can't we use it, right? With a sprinkle of public policy enforcement. Say, libraries are special. The Constitution, I mean, the Copyright Code recognizes this. Congress recognizes this. The Library of Congress recognizes this. Contract and licensing law can recognize it, too, through these publisher agreements, right? And that's part of the work that I've been doing with Library Futures, which was just launched in January. And what we're doing is we're working on state level ebook laws. You probably have seen some of these in the news. Um, in 2019 and 2021, uh, bills were introduced in state legislatures to compel publishers to license ebooks to libraries. Uh, the Maryland bill was the most famous, but similar legislation has been proposed uh, in New York and Rhode Island. Maryland actually became a law. 
And, and what we're doing here is we're trying to preserve, again, the work that everyone on this call is probably doing, right? We need to be able to loan these materials. How do we do that? Well, we need people to offer us reasonable terms and prohibit us from doing what they do, being charging us 10 times or embargo periods coming from the publishers, right? Uh, allow them. If you're going to sell in this state, you have to sell to libraries under reasonable terms, right? That's helpful. And if there's a violation of those terms, well, that's where state law kicks in. And again, this is not about copyright. This is about your license, which is a contract under co under uh, licensing and contract law. It needs to be fair. And if it's not fair, it's considered an unfair, abusive, or deceptive trade practice, which is subject to enforcement. And again, all we're saying is libraries are kind of special. Allow us to have licenses that are reflective of our mission. That would be a good start, I think. So that's one lesson. We can move into this space. The next one is the rediscovery of Section 108. This has been a, a, a one highlight of a, of a relatively dark time over the last 16 months in that we have a lot more rights under Section 108 than we perhaps realized. Section 108 is the building block for interlibrary loan, document delivery, and a lot of other library copying. It comes from this language here. I call this a library superpower. I coined this phrase at the beginning of the pandemic when I talked a little bit about, you know, hey, notwithstanding the exclusive rights of copyright owners, the bundle, right? We can do certain things, right? And again, this section 108 is the key to all of our work here, right? Fair use is for everyone, but section 108 is just for libraries. And it manifests our intent to continue to digitize, copy, transform, reproduce, and replicate to serve that greater mission, right? Preservation and access. And it didn't matter if it's poetry, textbooks, manuscripts, art, music, everything you can imagine. This is the engine behind document delivery, preservation, interlibrary loan. And I think what we learned during the pandemic is that there are very generous rights available to libraries to scan and distribute their works. Um, and, and accordingly, I'm going to just look at two as an example, and then we'll, we'll start to wind up here. Um, can I scan copies requests by user delivered to the directly to them? Yes, probably under fair use, but let's, let's look at through the lens of section 108 for a moment. My favorite one is out of print works. I literally talked about this at, uh, you know, for, for months and someone wrote back and said, I'm not sure this exists. And I was like, I swear it's real. If you have a work that's out of print under certain conditions, you can copy the entire work, the entire thing, the whole thing and send it to a user. As long as it cannot be obtained at a fair price, it becomes a property of the user, meaning you're not scanning it and putting it into some place for you to replicate over and over. And it's for private study research or scholarship. And you put the warning notice on it, which every interlibrary loan or document delivery generally has a cover sheet or some kind of notice. That was, a, that was an amazing thing. So if you can satisfy that test and it's out of print, that's a great way of providing your users with full books. Obviously, it's, it has to meet these factual scenarios, but that's an interesting one. The second one is there was a lot of discussion about what the premises of the library is. A lot of Section 108 says you can make preservation copies, you can make, you know, uh, unpublished copies, you can make published copies, but you have to keep it within the premises of the library. And there were a lot of answers. And a lot of people are like, well, that must be the four walls of the library and we can't possibly send this digital copy out to anyone else. And again, no. <laughs> a further reading of this, the language doesn't say the four walls of the library. The language doesn't say you can't send it out. The language in 108B and C says if you make a digital copy, right, it cannot be made available to the public in that format outside the premises of the library. Now, it doesn't define what to the public is, but the question that was answered is, can a uh, library or archive serve a discrete user community distinct from the public at large, maybe faculty or students at a university, maybe library college holders? This would help us provide off-campus premise, uh, sorry, off-premises, doesn't have to be campus, off-premises access to digital copies under Section 108 in some situations, right? Preservation copies they need for classroom study, for use by faculty, for use by students. This is informed by the idea that the meaning of the public is not well-defined here, but the public means everybody in the world. So, uh, you know, one of those library pandemic lessons, which I thought was really a lot of fun, was that premises library definitions have been informed by the statute's language, affirmed by community practice and advanced by the technology available. So in this last kind of mode here, we're thinking, well, what do we mean? Do we need digital access rooms? It's been called digital listening rooms, digital reading rooms. Yeah. And during this pandemic time, 
we have seen a lot of technologies and, and, and vendors of the technologies step up and say, yeah, this particular works, right? This is exactly what we're kind of talking about here, that, that we can beam something to somebody that's not here. Now, during the pandemic, very big lesson, very helpful. After the pandemic, which, you know, hopefully this ends soon, but what if we took these lessons that we learned um, and we applied them to normal times? I'd like to think of normal times. So instead of having a scholar burn all their grant money on plane tickets flying across the country to come to our reserves room, if we could almost beam an interlibrary loan to them, right? Using various methodologies. And as you can imagine, one of those methodologies would be controlled digital lending or something along those lines that gives us the ability to do that. And again, we learned this, another last pandemic lesson is, there's no emergency fair use, there's just fair use in an emergency. Meaning the factual scenarios that we outlined in, in these areas, I think are, are, are critically important. We're not, we don't get some special new power just because there's a, a public health emergency. But we, what we do is we look at fair use through the lens of the emergency facts, like libraries are closed, et cetera. So those are some of the pandemic lessons uh, I wanted to share with you today. Um, and of course, whoops, <laughs> of course, as, as I know that, I um, welcome uh, any questions stuff. I know we have limited time together here because it's your closing conference. But those are some of the lessons that I observed um, and will continue to observe and that we should take to heart and think about how this timeline has adjusted our workflows, our thinkings, and hopefully get us what we want, which is better access to materials for our patrons. Yeah, thank you, Kyle. And I just realized, of course, that I was so excited in getting you up that I didn't actually introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sorry. Hopefully, I, I saw I was... someone was kind enough to put my uh, my blog posts in the yeah, chat. That was... I think it says who I am there, but in case you don't know, yeah. uh, my name is Cal Cordy. I'm copyright advisor uh, and program manager out of the Harvard Library Office for Scholarly Communications. Um, and I also run the CFR National Network and I co-founded Library Futures, which I all talked about during my intro. Yeah. So if you didn't know who I am, I apologize, but maybe you do now. Yeah, no. yeah I just was like, oh, I wrote up a nice little intro and I was so excited. <laughs> Sorry. My pleasure. As everyone in the room laughs at me a little bit because I'm a little <laughs> bit of a fangirl. Um, so on, on that note, I want to thank Kyle for, for joining us. Uh, we don't want uh, um, this today. Uh, we do have hopes that uh, Kyle will be joining us uh, more next year, if that uh, what's uh, anyone's appetite for the 2022 conference. Um, on that note, I'm going to reset up my screen here to get me, because in order to watch your slides, I had to minimize my slides. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> well, no, it's just I had too many. I only have two screens, not three. <laughs> okay, so. Oh, wait. Back that up. Okay. There we go. So on that note. Um, I'm going to continue on with our traditional, oh, and I was going to say, it looks like Kyle is able to answer any Q&A um, answer type questions. So I think Kyle's going to go ahead and take that on. Um, so I want to say thank you uh, to all of my committee members again this year. Without them, uh, none of this would have been possible. Um, a lot of them will say a lot of, I do a lot of work, but really um, uh, without them, I could not do half of what uh, happens during this conference. Um, I would also like to thank our sponsors. Um, I'd, also, I'd like to give a special shout out to Emporia State University for sponsoring a portion of our event platform, Event Moby. I'd also like to thank OCLC for sponsoring our Zoom license. Both of these items are a large part of our budget. These organizations um, help us keep our conference fees low and give us the ability to provide a full conference experience, even though we cannot be together again this year in person. Um, I would also like to thank all of our presenters. Uh, without you, there is no conference. 
uh, we can have vendors, we can have sponsors, we can have a committee, but without sessions and presenters, there is nothing. So thank you for all of your amazing presentations this year. I would also like to thank our keynote, uh, keynote Katrina Davis Kendrick. Katrina's presentation on low morale was insightful to our community and the data we provided from her pre-conference surveys can now be found in the opening remarks section, opening remarks and keynote section of um, our platform, or you can go to the document section to see all the documents from this year's event. Now, my favorite part of the annual closing remarks, and that is when we ask you, our attendees, for feedback. Usually, um, I put a live document up on the screen and uh, one of my committee members will help fill in as you guys type things into the chat or when we are live as you speak through a microphone and share your, your opinions. But I'm doing things um, a little differently this year. And I am, I actually created um, a Google Doc that I'm going to go ahead and drop into the chat. Um, and I'm hoping I shared that correctly. Um, created that correctly so that everyone can log into that and uh, write some answers. Yes, I can. Awesome. Um, so the questions that I have in there are what has inspired you? from and um, to fill that in what has inspired you at um, from our presentations this year what highlights will you take back to your institution how can and will do better and is there anything else you'd like to share about the conference and this is a public document so um, if there's anything private you want to share you're more than welcome to email us um, but uh, your comments are also uh, entered into the form anonymously so uh, I don't know who's typing what, uh, unless you want to put your name at the end of one of your comments. Uh, while everyone is filling that in, um, I'm going to go ahead and go on to my next slide. Um, but it doesn't mean you have to leave that document. Because the next slide is actually kind of also talking about feedback. And it is... Um, our survey. So I want to let everyone know that and will will be sending a survey to the emails associated with your conference registration next week. I know some of you had to switch to your personal email accounts due to IT and firewall issues. So please watch your personal account for the and will um, survey. Everyone who fills out the survey, and I apologize if it's a little long, but we do use the information um, and provides an email address at the end, will be entered into a raffle for a, um, a gift card to bookshop.org. This information helps us make valuable decision, decisions such as how long lunch breaks should be. And I'm still sorry for last year's short lunch, lunch breaks. Um, but this year, I hope I did better on that. And if we're on the right, and of course, if we're on the right track for our programming. Now I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the some of the feedback here. Um, and actually, can I? I'm going to stop sharing one screen and share the other screen. For the live feedback and I'm so some of you wrote on what inspired you at and will um, I can't wait to try some of the automation tricks and tips to save time and provide better service um, <laughs> the the feeling of um, community all the information uh, a lot of great stuff on automation and the use of data and statistics seeing staff around the country was great so many ideas somebody seems to have really enjoyed the lightning rounds excellent um what highlights will you take back to your institution uh wayback machine i love using the wayback machine it has come in handy more than once for me um dei ideas uh, we had a couple of sessions on that and um, i agree some of them are absolutely fantastic and i hope to bring them back to my own institution and what can and will do better? And um, 
Oh, explaining all the acronyms every single time. You know what? I admit some of us who have been here a really long time have a tendency of getting stuck in those. And um, I've, I, I think we all run into that and sometimes we forget. So thank you for bringing that up. It's really helpful to hear that. Um, uh, anything else you'd like to share about the conference? Some love for the event Moby platform uh, for the virtual conference and hope to attend next year virtually or in person. Um, somebody did put in the link asking about uh, will the site be up next week and we have access to this for at least the next three months. Um, so yes, you have access to the platform um, for a while. Uh, love that. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and switch back to um, my slides. Uh, it's helpful if I click on the correct side of all of this. Thank you. Your, all of your information is very valuable. And that link is going to be there. So you, you're welcome to keep typing it in. The information is very helpful to us. So um, thank you for all of those words. And N will attempt to use your feedback each year to do better, um, which is one of the reasons why we make a call for volunteers every year. First is the call for committee members over here on the left with the, the purple title. On the survey we send out is a spot to express your interest in joining the NWIL committee. NWIL is entirely ran by volunteers and every year some stay and some leave depending on their work commitments. Every committee member is required to have permission from their supervisor and the time commitment can be small or as big as you wish. However, it is work. We also like to put the seed in attendees minds now for next year's conference. It's often helpful to start thinking about presentation topics now since we'll probably be putting a call out for sessions in about five months. This year's annual had a wide variety of topics and we're always looking to provide more. That includes sessions on ILL 101 to the ILL life cycle in the public library. That latter one is something I have never seen at NWIL, and I think many of us would find interesting. The benefit of being on the committee or presenting at NWIL is free registration, new friends, and experience. Uh, so public speaking experience and experience in either so planning the conference or public speaking experience or both. It's a great resume builder and has one, com um, has one committee member told me being on the NWIL committee is one of the first times where their voice has been heard and had an effect. The committee honestly attempts to hear every voice. On that note, our door prize game is still going on and winners will be notified by email. Names will be posted on this event platform with their permission once ready. All attendees have access to this platform for the next three months. On that note, there's one more door prize code. And this giant Wyoming park has its own judicial system. The answer is Yellowstone National Park, and I will drop that into the chat as well. And as some people have commented about how many I've been to, yes, I have been to Yellowstone National Park. <laughs> Um, as you might imagine, I have gone done a lot of uh, traveling around the, the West Coast National Parks. Um, I got a pretty bad sunburn at that one. Um, but it was a cool day and I didn't realize how warm it was getting. Story of my life. And I'm going to go ahead and move along. And on that note, um, I would like to thank everyone for attending NWL 2021 and making our, our virtual event a success. We appreciate everyone coming and once again, nearly selling us out at 469 attendees. I would also like to, to uh, wish all of our Jewish attendees a happy new year. The committee made an effort this year to avoid the holidays in our conference schedule, which is why we're a little earlier than uh, we would normally be on the calendar.
Uh, and as I keep on realizing, I keep on saying on that note, I would like everyone to put an approximate save the date on their calendars for uh, September 2022 for the 21st annual Northwest Interlibrary Loan and Resource Sharing Conference. At this time, we will acknowledge that our location is TBD as the pandemic continues. The 2022 committee will need to make the decision early next year on when we know more about the state of the world. I know that's a little ambiguous, but that's kind of the state of the world that we're in. And now, if you'd like to hang out a little longer, I'll be over in the general hangout uh, for a little while. Otherwise, uh, we will see you all next year.